Christ, according to St. John. Glory to you, Lord of Christ. Jesus went to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, also called the Sea of Tiberias. A large crowd kept following him because they saw the signs that he was doing for the sick. Jesus went up the mountain and sat down there with his disciples. Now the Passover, the festival of the Jews, was near. When he looked up and saw a large crowd coming toward him, Jesus said to Philip, Where are we to buy bread for these people to eat? He said this to test him, for he knew him. He himself knew what he was going to do. Philip answered him, Six months' wages would not buy enough bread for each of them to get a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There is a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are they among so many people? Jesus said, Make the people sit down. Now there was a great deal of grass in the place, so they sat down, about 5,000 in all. Then Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed to them who were seated, so also the fish, as much as they wanted. When they were satisfied, he told his disciples, gather up the fragments left over so that nothing may be lost. So they gathered them up, and from the fragments of the five barley loaves left by those who had eaten, they filled twelve baskets. When the people saw the sign that he had done, they began to say, This indeed is the prophet who is to come into the world. When Jesus realized that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, he withdrew again to the mountain by himself. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord of Christ. Would you pray with me? Call us, O Lord, in the freshness of your love and service. Free us through the sharing of your word and sacraments to serve you forevermore. This we ask in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. There was a time when after-school television was much more edifying than what it is today. Uh, in fact, I'm not even sure that there's even after-school shows for kids anymore. I think it's all talk shows and uh, paternity tests to find out who's the father of your baby and all sorts of other things that they put on these shows. But when I was growing up, yeah, I'm getting to be that, that age when I compare these things, you know. When I was growing up, and I think Emily probably remembers this as well, and those of you who had kids in the, especially in the mid to late 70s, you'll understand this as well. I think even into the 80s. Uh, they had something on television called Schoolhouse Rock. And uh, I remember, I think that the cartoon character that I'm remembering was a pair. And he had nice shoes, really spindly legs and spindly arms, and had, had a cane that he twirled and wore a top hat, I believe. And he was constantly singing about the virtues of eating healthy. And there would be, if I've got this right in my memory, and I think I do, there would be a picture of a, of a young boy, a cartoon, you know, of a young boy who, you know, he had circles under his eyes and he was lethargic and he was dragging and, and come to find out this poor boy had been eating junk food all day. And so the singing pair would then talk about the virtues of carrots and cheese and good things to eat instead
instead of the junk food. And the next thing you know, you would see this boy just full of energy and re you know ready and rearing to go. We are, according to those cartoons, what we eat. And sometimes that's not a pleasant thing to consider, uh, especially given pre-processed foods and heaven only knows what they put in them, in them these days. But be that as it may, spiritually speaking, we also are what we eat. God's chosen people were choosing to eat a spiritual diet that dabbled in the junk food of the pagan religions that surrounded them. And sooner or later, the junk food began to supplant completely the nourishment that God wanted to give them. In fact, our reading from the Old Testament today says, they kept mocking the messengers of God, despising his words, his food, and scoffing at his prophets until the wrath of the Lord against his people became so great that there was no remedy. In order for there to be a remedy for malnutrition of the spirit, God's people must be willing to listen to what he is, he is saying to them. They must be willing to, to pause, to listen, to respond, to receive. God is the initiator, we are the receptor. And in that equation, we cannot grow and we cannot thrive and we cannot have fellowship with the Lord who created us if we choose to eat spiritual junk food. Now, it's been said that the times in which we live mirror more closely the first century world or even the world of the ancient Israelites more so than in any other time since the birth, death, burial, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus. Why? Why? Because cultures that were once permeated with the things of God are now dabbling with things that are not of God. I see it every day. I hear conversations. I hear stories on the radio. I have conversations where I work with people who are mixing and matching and making up their own religion as they go. Spiritual junk food. It will not save their souls. It will not bring them joy and peace. It will simply be something of their own creation, simply what it was for God's chosen people. And of course, God's solution was to take them into time out. To let them understand that what they need is what they've been rejecting. And what they've been rejecting has been taken away from them so that they can feel the angst of not being where God led them to be in the promised land doing what God led them to do, finding fellowship with him in worship, in prayer, in song, in fellowship with each other. And along comes Jesus. Because all of those centuries later, after the return from exile, after 70 years in Babylon, Israel still doesn't get it. I spoke last week of our human nature being something that is unchanging, it's fixed. We are born in a state of sin, we need to be regenerated in Jesus Christ. That is true at all times, in all places, for all people. And so the unregenerated spirit of man and woman is such that we are prone, as the hymn 
writer says, to wander. We are prone to dabble. We are prone to seek things that are not nourishing to our soul. And so Jesus comes in the fullness of time. And he meets with his people. He, he begins working miracles. And he begins preaching. He begins to share with Israel the sustenance that they have still managed to largely ignore. And they're so mesmerized by this. Because they tasted something that they had not tasted before. A closeness to God. Though they cannot put a name on it. And though they may not be able to voice it. They have discovered the sweetness of the presence of the living God. And so they follow Jesus into this desolate area. Right before the Passover. And they're hungry. And they're needing nourishment, not only of the soul, but of the body. And Jesus draws them out into the wilderness where he and they know that there is no other food than what he can give them. And he takes these few barley loaves and these few fish and he offers them up to the Father. And there's enough for 5,000. And their eyes are opened a little wider now. The message that he's sharing is a little clearer now. Because they are receiving sustenance and they're tasting what good food should taste like, not only in their stomach, but in their very soul. And they want to make him king. And he resists. For good reason. There's more ministry to be done. What's in the oven is not yet completely done. But we do know where it ends. We do know the reasons why he was doing what he was doing. Paul tells us, You were dead through the trespasses and sins in which you once lived following the course of this world, following the ruler of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work among those who are disobedient, those who are dabbling, those who are making their entire diet out of junk food. All of us once lived like them in the passions of our flesh, following the desires of flesh and senses, and we were children by nature, children of wrath, like everyone else. Even those of us who have been in the church all of our lives, we have gone through seasons where we have dabbled. We have gone through times in which we have sought after spiritual junk food, perhaps to a lesser degree, perhaps to a greater degree. We've been there. We've done that. Because none is righteous. No, not one. And so we have before us today, as we progress toward the cross with Jesus, we have before us today food that gives life. And not just ordinary life eternal life. And eternal life isn't just measured by eternity, it's measured by the quality of life. When we are born into God's kingdom, we are born into that eternity, into that quality of life 
that raises us from junk food status to the richness of God's table. The richness of God's table. The richness of God's table. The question for us is, how often, like me, how often do we take it for granted? Because Paul says that even though we are not saved by works, we are saved for good works. We are saved so that we can go on to know Jesus, to be thankful to him, and out of gratitude and out of love for what he has done for us, to savor all of the goodness that he gives to us and to share it with those around us. I take it for granted too often. Do you? May this Eucharist that we celebrate today, may it be a new taste in our mouth. May it be a refreshing nourishment in our soul. May Jesus come bodily into us and spiritually into us that we may be born with new life again. Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you. We thank you for taking those people into the wilderness and doing what no other could do, feeding them. Jesus, come and feed us today. Let us taste and see that the Lord really is good. Let us know, let us know that you have come to live in our hearts. We ask this in your holy name.